began. Amen. You may be seated. So good to have Lowell back. Um, you know, these rock stars go on these tours all over the, the country, and, and, uh, and Lowell and Betty have been on the family tour for the last uh, several weeks, and it's good to have you all back. You know, All Saints Day always brings out in me thoughts concerning my own mortality on this earth, and I have to confess that as every year goes by, I, I, I think more and more about that. And, and as we, we celebrate the lives of, uh, of these who have passed from our midst, I can't help but wonder if, if in a relatively few fleeting years from now, a church family somewhere will gather and remember my life on, on a special Sunday such as this. And, we can't help but wonder, especially as we get older, how we will be remembered after we're gone. And, and, and so I have, a, have to confess this morning that, that such speculation has led me to have a great fascination with what people have placed on their tombstones or, or other people place on their tombstones when, when they die, an, an epitaph, a statement or two that is intended to, to sum up their life. I confess that from time to time I like to stroll through cemeteries studying tombstones. And now, now, of course, messages on tombstones take a lot of, of different forms. Some of them are, are just straight and to the point. They have the, the dates of birth and death or, or their spouse of or child of, those kinds of informational items. Or, but others are, are, are more flowery and poetic. Sometimes they're they're designed not to reveal one's true nature in life, but, but rather make them seem more acceptable in the afterlife. For, for instance, in a cemetery in Dallas, Texas, there is a stone that, that reads, as the flowers are all made sweeter by the sunshine and the dew, so the old world is made brighter by the lives of folks like you. It's a, it's a beautiful sentiment. However, it's on the tombstone of Bonnie Parker, of the notorious crime duo of, of Bonnie and Clyde. And, and then there are others that, that, that are brutally honest, sometimes even confessional in nature. In a cemetery in Plymouth, Massachusetts, where many of the first pilgrims are entombed, there is a tombstone that reads this, he was a failure as a husband. He was insane 15 years because of liquor. May Christ have mercy on his soul. And, and in just in case we were wondering, it concludes he was not a pilgrim. <laughs> but then there are others that, that seek to invite more serious reflection on our life. The English architect Christopher Wren is buried in in St. Paul's Cathedral in London, which he designed, and on his monument are printed these words, if you seek my monument, look around you. But my, my favorite epitaphs are those which reflect our struggle to, to know and, and to live out God's will for our lives in this world. Somehow they, they, they give me hope and encouragement in, in the midst of my own struggles. Often those are summarized by, by a favorite scripture. And, and while those scriptures vary widely, by my casual observation wandering in cemeteries, the most prominent one is, is some variation of Paul's words to Timothy where he said, I fought the good fight. I've finished the race, I've kept the faith, and now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness. Now, it seems to me that that's the perfect epitaph for a saint because it acknowledges that a life of faith is sometimes a great struggle, a, a fight, a, a race to the finish, but for, that for those who keep the faith, in the end there will be grace and eternity. Saints aren't perfect people, but, but rather people who spend a lifetime seeking to discern and, and live into God's will and who are rewarded for their struggles and for their perseverance with an eternity where righteousness prevails. And so in those times when we reflect on our own mortality, that reflection inevitably turns to God's will for us. And, and it seems to me that, that the question that we wrestle with every time we come to a crossroads in our lives, a moment of, of decision or perhaps indecision, 
oftentimes it's God's will that becomes most troublesome for us. When, when we're making choices like our vocation or, or marriage and family or school, those life-changing kinds of, of decisions, the kind of things that, that, that sometimes end up not only being the, our direction in life, but also become our epitaph. I've struggled with these kinds of questions on more than one occasion in my life, and, and it's in moments such as these that I reflect on, on my own fight, my own race towards righteousness. You know, sometimes our epitaphs are a reflection of our greatest struggles in life. Well, this 17th chapter of John that Lowell just read a portion of is a prayer of Jesus. And it is spoken just hours before his death. It could have been his epitaph, the words on his tombstone, if he had stayed in the grave long enough to have a tombstone. And he says to God, I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. In other words, Jesus has fulfilled God's will for his life on earth. But it's interesting that, that Jesus never did most of the things that we think about when we think about God's will for our lives. I, I, I think about all those times that I have struggled with, with important questions in my life. For most of us, those are the times when, when this question of God's will and purpose really becomes to us and causes us to, to wrestle with the life choices that we make. But if you think about it, Jesus didn't have those kinds of struggles. There's, there's no evidence that Jesus ever struggled with the question of whether it was God's will that he marry or, or start a family. He certainly didn't struggle with God's will when it came to questions of schooling or vocation or, or even ministry. The, the earthly things that we struggle with in relationship to God's will were not a concern for Jesus. I think Jesus' understanding of God's will and his purpose transcended earthly concerns. And, and what I have come to realize in my own struggles is that discerning God's will becomes a real struggle when I try to place God's will into my earthly concerns rather than place my earthly concerns into the will of God. C.S. Lewis once wrote, there are two kinds of people. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, all right then, have it your way. As, and as I read that bit of wisdom from such a great Christian mind, it occurred to me that often my life is, is directed towards trying to make God submit to my will and say, all right then, Mark, have it your way. Because really, the scriptures are pretty clear about, about what God's ultimate will is for our lives. In the letter to the Romans, the Apostle Paul writes, Do not be conformed to the things of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. And what is the perfect will of God that Paul has on in his mind? Well, what, he goes on to say this, that we fulfill the purpose for which we were created, to know God, to receive his love, and to live in communion with him forever. You know, thousands of years ago, the prophet Micah said much the same thing when, when he said, what does the Lord require of you but that you do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. No more, no less. And so as, as we are thinking about the potential epitaphs on, on this All Saints Day, on, about words that, that might somehow reflect the essence of our lives, I, I think these are the words that, that summarize the life of a saint. It's not a, a perfect life. It's, it's not a life of miraculous deeds, but rather saints are those who do their best to do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with their God. And so as we honor these saints today, I, I wanted to suggest some ways perhaps that, that we need to be writing the epitaph of our life, uh, some simple instructions, if you will, about how to become a saint. 
And the first is that, that we must follow the instructions. Now, I confess that I am terrible at following instructions. I, I have this project before me, and, and my first assumption is that I know better how to put it together than those who wrote the instructions in the first place. So I just jump right in. I only refer to the instructions as a last desperate resort. And even then, it's, it's more to try and, and fit someone else's vision into my vision. G give me a picture of how things are supposed to turn out, and then rather than, than read the directions, I'd rather just struggle to figure out how to get there on my own. Men, are, are you with me here? Well, well, too often, that's how I approach God's will for my life. I know that the instructions are here, everything that I need. But, but oftentimes I would prefer to struggle and try to find my own way. And so in all the important decisions of my life, I, I have struggled because I thought I was trying to discern what the instructions were, what, what God's will was. But what I was really struggling with was how to fit God's will into what I really envisioned for my life. Lord, I, I have this, this vision for how things ought to, to work out. Please make your will fit into my vision. But you see, the instructions say that to be a saint, it doesn't really matter what choices I make. As long as I follow these simple instructions, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. That's God's perfect will for each one of us. And so saints are those who, who follow the instructions. And, and in doing so, Dante wrote in his Inferno, in his will then, we will find peace. Saints find peace in following the instructions. And then, then, then secondly, sainthood is lived out, according to Paul, in the context of our relationship with God. You see, we often view sainthood in relationship to the world, related to worldly things and, and worldly practices. But that's not where we see true saints. Paul says that we can only understand his will for us when we live in communion with him forever. We can only know God's will when we know God. Saints are those who are coming to know God. One writer makes this comment, his revealed will and his plan for our lives are part of our larger relationship with him. Our primary purpose as Christians is not to figure out what lies ahead for us, it is to glorify God with our lives right now. Karen and I have been married for, for almost 40 years now, and in those years, I have come to know how Karen will react in nearly any situation. Often, I know what she needs and she wants before she ever asks. But when we were first married, all of that was pretty much a mystery to me. Uh, how, however, as our relationship has grown and matured, those things have become much clearer to me. Oh, I still get it wrong sometimes, but I'm still learning. I've come a long way. That's how it is with our relationship with God. The more we come to know Him through Scripture and prayer and worship and Christian fellowship and service, the more we will understand how His will is manifested in and through our lives. The closer I am with God, the more I find myself in His will. Saints are those who focus on their relationship with God first, and then out of that they discover His will. And, and then I've discovered that God's will is often most clearly seen in retrospect. Most often it's easier to see where you've been rather than where you're going. When I go to the movies, I, I, I like to get there early because one of my favorite things about the movies is the previews of coming attractions. I like to know what's up ahead. And, and, and when we try to discern God's will, it seems to me that we are trying to get God to give us preview of the coming attractions in our life. If, if I make this choice now, God, how is it going to turn out? 
But you see, God doesn't work that way. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. One writer comments, when you take time to examine your life's journey so far, you may be surprised to see how God's fingerprints are in places you never noticed before, not only in the things that have happened, but in also in the things that haven't happened. The fact is that God closes as many doors as he opens. I've had many times when I've, I've been confronted with very difficult choices and, and I've struggled to see God in the midst of those, to, to discern His will. But now I can look back and, and see how, how God was working through all of that all along. Oftentimes, God's will becomes much clearer in retrospect than it was as I tried to gaze into the future. And so saints are those who place themselves in God's hands and say, Thy will be done, and surrender our future to Him, rather than trying to place Him into the future that we are envisioning for ourselves. And, and so when we get in trouble, it's because we try to wrestle that future away from him and take it back on ourselves. Saints live by the wisdom of, and, and I want you to say it with me, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. Because here's the thing, we can never envision a future greater than the one that God has planned for us. And, and then finally, as saints, his will for our life is always good, even though there are times when it doesn't seem that way. The perfect will of God doesn't mean that our life is going to be perfect. There are going to be times when our life will be shaken to its very core and we'll face tr struggles and trials on this earth. You see, we often think that discerning God's will is, is, is equal to finding where we fit in, in, in life on this earth. But the truth is that sometimes God's will makes us misfits on this earth. And if we truly submit to God's will for our lives, if we do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with Him, there are going to be times when we are at odds with the world. And we'll find ourselves more as outcasts, ostracized, placed in circumstances where we're going to be most uncomfortable. Saints are not perfect people. They don't know everything, but rather they are the ones who know that God's will is perfect because His will is eternal, not momentary. Only God can see beyond this world to a life that will be lived eternally. Where we struggle is when we try to confine the will of God for us just to the things of, uh, of this world. When Paul wrote to the Romans, for we know that all things work for, together for good, for, for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, he did not mean that everything in our earthly life was always going to work out for the good, even for those who love God or especially for those who love God, but in that context of forever with God, things will always work out for the good doesn't mean that we're not going to make some mistakes in this life, that, that we're not going to have some struggles, that, that some of the choices that we make will be bad choices. It doesn't mean that we'll never be sick, that we'll never have pain, we'll never live without resources, or, or that we'll never squander the resources that we're given, but it does mean that for those who do justice, who love mercy, and who walk with God in all things, even the bad things in life will ultimately turn out to His glory. There will be times when we get off track, when the choices that we make or, or others make for us place us outside of God's will. One writer compares those to detours and says, life's detours often reveal to us that God is a God of fresh alternatives. God works after the fact of tragedy and trouble to reveal new avenues of growth and hope and opportunity. And all of that 
can be ours, dear saints, when we stop trying to take God's will and fit it into our lives. His will for us is too big to be contained in these earthly vessels. But saints are those who take their lives and seek to place it in God's will. The story is told of, of a young man who was confused about his life. And, and one day he went into a church sanctuary and he was determined to stay there until he discerned what God's will was for his life. And so he knelt down at the altar and he took a piece of paper and he began to write down all of the, the promises of things that he was going to do in his life for God. And then he signed it and he, and he sat back and he, he waited for God to reveal his will to them. But there was, there was no immediate response. He waited in that sanctuary for hours. And then finally, the Lord spoke to his heart and said to him, You're going about this all wrong. I don't desire to consecrate your life like that. Tear up all that you've written. And so re reluctantly, the young man tore up the paper, and, and then the Lord said to him, Now take a blank piece of paper, sign your name to it, and let me fill it in for you. And he said years later, after he retired from the mission field, when he was sharing his witness in church, it was just a secret between God and me as I signed that page. And God has been filling it in for the past 26 years. What does the Lord require of you? What is his perfect will for you? It is that you do justice and you love mercy and you walk humbly with him in all circumstances. And if you do that in your workplace and your home and, and your church and, and your friendships and relationships and the way you treat strangers, then you will always be in the perfect will of God and you too will be a saint and your epitaph will read that you fought the good fight and now have received your crown of righteousness so this morning as we receive this sacrament as he offers his life for us offer him, your life to him all that you are and let him fill in the rest that's how you become a saint Amen.